Thank you very much for, for this uh, lengthy introduction. Uh, let me first uh, thank Turkey American Alliance for this kind invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to share with you some, some, some thoughts. Uh, we are living in such a dynamic world that uh, what we say today uh, is obsolete uh, tomorrow. And maybe that's even more important when we speak about the relevant issues that uh, we have the understanding uh, of the past. Only if we are able to understand the past, uh, we can, uh, of course, trace our past to the future. Because a lot of uh, misunderstandings are caused by the way of simplifying certain historical events. and. Uh, as you know, Europe and the whole world has undergone uh, deep tectonic changes, historically speaking, in the past uh, 20 years. And I wish to talk to you about a little bit about that. Because if I would talk only on Slovenia, I guess it would be too narrow. And uh, wherever I go to the States, I face uh, with the problem of the lack of identity. And uh, that's why I have to put Slovenia first on the map. But I wish to emphasize that Slovenia is also a result of these tectonic changes that has taken place. I, I guess everybody is aware of the existence of the country of uh, Yugoslavia, which Slovenia was part of. Uh, not many knew that this was really a multinational state that uh, included also Slovenia as a, as a, as a federal state. Uh, of course, uh, Slovenian political ideas, Slovenian past towards establishment of its statehood nationhood has longer history. But only in 1848, during the so-called Spring of Nations, Slovene political elite was able to design its political program. Then to witness the critical moment after the First World War, after the dissolution of uh, two big empires, as we know, Ottoman Empire and Austro-Hungarian Empire. Slovenia was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And then Slovenian political elite, while designing already its political program, decided to join the Union of Slavic Nations. That was the most critical decision uh, at that time. Uh, so the kingdom of Slovenes, Croats and Serbs were created. That was, in fact, the nucleus of, a, of, a, of a Yugoslavia that uh, came uh, out of that. So Slovenia was, uh, so to say, uh, over 70 years uh, a part of the, uh, of the multinational entity called, called Yugoslavia. And uh, the specifics of this entity where that uh, high degree of autonomy was granted by the Constitution as well. And uh, that is uh, something that at a critical juncture enabled uh, its constituent part to make a decision either to stay within Yugoslavia or to, to depart. I, I wish to share with you just uh, 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 maybe a few moments on, on what, what do I understand by this, by this uh, critical junction. And here, of course, we have to uh, um, embrace and, and understand the development in Europe uh, 20 years ago, uh, late uh, 80s, uh, when uh, democratic changes started in Europe when uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall happened, uh, when the countries uh, so many decades, a few decades ruled by, by Soviet Union 
started a quest for their independence and more importantly quest for their democratization. This was in fact a quest for democratization. Now Yugoslavia missed that opportunity to embark on the road of democratization. And uh, that was the critical juncture when Yugoslavia departed from the processes that so many other countries in the Central and Eastern Europe embarked upon. Instead of democracy, unfortunately, in former Yugoslavia, nationalism prevailed. And to have a better understanding, because here and there, even in the United States, we have to face some simplification which are trying to suggest that today's independent states seceded from Yugoslavia. That is uh, far from the, from the truth. What was critically important at that time was that Yugoslavia lacked basic democratic institutions which would be capable to deal with diversity. Now, diversity is something that is not strange to Europe, as you know. Quite a number of European countries, going from North to Belgium, Spain, even France, you can go in here in your neighborhood, to Canada. They all face this issue of diversity. Yugoslavia was an example of diversity with six republics, two provinces, three languages, three religions, two alphabets, you name it. And to, to manage this diversity, one really has to develop political system with democratic institutions which are able and capable to cope with this diversity. If these institutions are lacking, of course, also if political culture, appropriate political culture is lacking, if politi political leadership is not embracing new ideas, then you face a serious challenge. And this was the challenge that Yugoslavia was faced with. Don't forget, at that time, during these huge changes, a number of multinational states collapsed, starting with Soviet Union. But there you had, however you define that, you had an agreement in Almaty, which in fact enabled peaceful disintegration. All problems, even conflicting one, that we have witnessed after that dissolution of Soviet Union were the results of, of course, of unsolved issues that were brought about to the surface uh, after these processes were mainly concluded. The second example was Czechoslovakia, which of course, was much easier to dealt with because it was only a union of two nations. But what is important here to say is that this disintegration, this separation, took place in a civilized, uh, uh, agreed manner that whatsoever caused no conflict even at the later stage. In case of Yugoslavia, Unfortunately, this was a violent solution, uh, a violent separation. I will risk uh, a degree of simplifying the issue, but by saying that simply uh, some uh, members of these multinational societies were simply trying to impose you know, their views on how the future state of Yugoslavia should look like. The view of Slovenia as the most, let's say, developed economically and also politically because all liberal ideas, in fact, in, in, in former Yugoslavia to a great degree started in Slovenia. 
the idea of Slovenia first was to democratize Yugoslavia. Unfortunately, we failed in doing so. Because late 80s, European Union already got its momentum. The, in an, an early 90s, there was expected a new wave of EU enlargement that included especially uh, Austria and Sweden, which we looked as an example very much. And I can only share with you one detail. In, in early 1990, before, before the changes in Yugoslavia, really political changes started, before first democratic elections took place in Slovenia and later on in other parts of Yugoslavia, Slovenian government, which has enjoyed a high degree of autonomy, uh, in fact, adopted a law that was very similar to the law of Sweden, which was waiting at the door to EU, which passed so-called Green Book. We, we passed so-called White Book, copied by the Swedish example. And the basic substance of, of this legislation was that the, that the government could adopt no law that would run contrary to the EU law. So you see, even at the beginning of 1990, Slovenia understood which way we should pursue. Our problem was that Belgrade did not understand that. And we lacked the capacity, obviously, to convince Belgrade uh, to embark with a greater determination, greater speed to the EU integration. And that was, of course, then where we reach the point of, again, critical decision. This decision can be compared with the decision in 1918, as I said, at the end of the First World War, where Slovenian, Slovenians had to decide what they will do with their nationhood, with their statehood. So we have decided then to opt for European perspective. Croatia followed us very closely, and later on also other countries, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Macedonia. Montenegro at that part was still uh, integrated with, with, with Serbia. So shortly, I just wanted to portray you uh, uh, this, this picture as to uh, understand what this challenge and perspective that was opened with the end of the Cold War, with the start of democratization in Europe, brought about also to a nation as, as Slovenia. So this was the environment within which we have defined our political future. And it is important to say that democratic processes that took place in Europe were of critical importance not only for the future EU member states, not only for the states of the Western Balkans, of Central and Eastern Europe, but also for the Europe at large. Because we have been dealing with the separated Europe, and we have still the remnants of this separation that is the result of the Second World War. That is, that is why uh, the, the, the perspective that was opened uh, from the EU uh, was of a critical importance for the future development of all these countries uh, in, the, in the rest of the world. So one, one can really uh, ask and question what, what went wrong uh, with, with Yugoslavia, but uh, uh, simply I, 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 tried, uh, I, I tried to share with you 
to, to understand where was the point of departure and where are the sources also of some remaining tensions that remain in the Western Balkans. Uh, but of course, when, when it comes to, to Europe and EU at large, I think it is worth to dwell on these processes, which were strongly supported also from the United States with this project of creating Europe whole and free and at peace. This is something that has tremendous uh, political strength uh, that has not been exhausting even as we speak today. The EU integration is of historical significance to Europe and its member states. And moreover, for many countries, newly established or newly liberated, newly democratized, EU was an inspiration for change. EU was encouragement for change. And that is something that remains relevant even today as we speak of the perspective of other countries which are striving to become an EU member. Because political elite and societies sometimes they do, they do need encouragement for change. Political changes so often they do not come just by, by themselves. And the uh, EU is an uh, engine for this change. It means that you have to adapt your institutions, your practices, that you have to improve your economy so that you are fit for the family that you want to enjoy. These are not formal conditions. These are conditions that are transforming societies. And that makes, of course, the unity uh, of uh, all European member states, EU member states, uh, stronger when they share the same institutions uh, uh, and the same, uh, the same uh, practices. What has happened with European Union in uh, 2004 with this big bank enlargement that, that that shaped European Union uh, at large. Uh, as you know, 10 new member states joined European Union. And two years later, two more, Bulgaria and Romania. So 12 states, 12 new member states. Uh, this was to a great degree uh, economically motivated process. And with this enlargement, EU gained about 5.5 percent of the GDP, it gained 27 percent of the population, and it also considerably changed the balance between small and large countries, because basically these new member states were small or medium if you take Poland countries. So it means that it has a larger group of countries which have some defined specific interest uh, to work along with other small countries within EU in pursuing their own interests. The, the problem, to my mind, is that EU has not digested fully yet this enlargement from 2004. Uh, and uh, that is a challenge that uh, we are working with as we speak. Uh, that is the challenge also that is posed to the policy of further EU enlargement. Because as you know, we talk about EU fatigue. Uh, there is a general view that uh, there has been uh, reached an upper level of EU capacity to embrace new states. And there is growing conflicting there are growing conflicting views on between two processes of deepening of Europe and further enlargement. Now, 
what what Slovenia stands for. We believe that there should be no limitations to further EU enlargement. That EU should continue to pursue with the policies of further embracing new countries. Next year, as you know, Croatia is to become a new EU member state uh, as a 28th mem member state. And we fear that EU at large may lose its momentum. That's why Slovenia, along with some other partners within European Union, we are striving to keep this enlargement agenda alive because we see the merits of this policy to be continued in many aspects. Let me start with, the, with that one that I mentioned to you, that EU perspective is a strong incentives for these countries to pursue the policy of change, of transformation. Without this perspective, these countries may take much, much longer to become a part of a modern states with uh, developed institutions, uh, with the rule of law, and with uh, efficient economies. This is, enlargement is also in the interest of EU because it embraces the countries which are adding to the value of European Union as a global factor. Of course, we cannot uh, disregard the problem of deepening of EU because as the EU was growing, so were uh, growing demands or expectations how issues are dealt with within this family and institutions, EU institutions that were designed to, to run for 12 countries does not serve the environment where you have now 27 countries. That's why we have ongoing process of, of, of upgrading, so to say, EU institutions. Uh, of course, the problem is that that this needs consent of all 27. And Slovenia has learned how to work for the consensus. We have lived in uh, multinational you know, societies from, from Austrian Habsburg Empire in Yugoslavia. In Yugoslavia, we have on display all the time uh, uh, the exercise how to work in direction of consensus. So uh, this, is the, this is the policy that the Slovenia is, is uh, pursuing strongly and, uh, uh, and when this, this relates also to the perspective of, of Turkey when it comes to EU. And 10 days ago when, when uh, Prime Minister of Turkey was visiting Slovenia, this was a part of discussion and uh, uh, we have absolutely no second thoughts about that. that this EU enlargement perspective, that this EU membership perspective uh, should be, uh, should continue to be open and should embrace also uh, Turkey. Because also when, uh, as it goes for some maybe smaller politically, not that heavyweight countries as Turkey is, but it is also relevant for Turkey that EU enlargement is in fact incentive for democratic processes, for structural reforms that makes Turkey compatible to EU uh, are, are continued. Let me say uh, a word or two on, on now on the, on the crisis that, that, that uh, EU is, is facing with. As I said, unlike in the United States, with which some comparison are made so often, uh, EU is embracing uh, 27 nation states. 
So it means that 27 parliaments has to endorse any decision that is relevant for EU policies. So nothing can happen unless and until all 27 agrees. That makes this process of deepening of EU quite a demanding process. But like when walking, EU is learning. And EU has increased its efficiency in dealing, uh, in dealing with these uh, challenging issues. When you compare these challenges with the United States, well, <coughs> you, one cannot escape from the observation that also in the United States, the Congress has its own mind and that administration has to work hard to convince that certain novelties, <coughs> certain changes are, are needed. <coughs> so the path towards the compromise is the path that EU is learning, and that will remain also for the future. The crisis that we are in now is the consequence of the incomplete political decisions that have been taken lately. If I only focus on the decision to create Eurozone, that was a political decision that uh, some <coughs> EU member states took. And that, that envisaged also a degree of a monetary integration. But what lacked was fiscal integration and integration of economic policies. These critical issues, when dealing with the effects of the euro crisis, uh, showed to be the most important obstacles for Europe to deal more effectively with the crisis that we are in. And basically, that means that EU member states are still hesitant to give away with the, their authority when it comes uh, to the uh, fiscal issues and to the economic policies issues. I would dare to say that the only way forward if EU is to get out stronger and more efficient is to speed up and to elevate the level of integration that will include fiscal integration. That would be huge for EU member states. That may mean that EU will progress further on on a two tracks, one in EU Eurozone and with heading towards uh, uh, fiscal integration, and the other one that will simply go with the level of integration that applies for all EU member states. That is feasible, possible scenario. That is not what also Slovenia would wish. But Slovenia will also have to make a decision, and we want to go with those who go on the faster track for the further EU integration. This Greek crisis now is a playground for and a political challenge in the near future for decisions to take place in EU in EU at large. It is difficult to predict the outcome, but uh, uh, again, if EU wants to play a role on the global scale, it, it has to improve its capacity to act effectively in the world and global scene. Uh, in, in conclusion, let me just say a few words on transatlantic relations. I, when, when I talk about Slovenia, of course, I, I, I want to talk about EU because Slovenia is, is a part of EU, and uh, maybe somebody would ask why you left Yugoslavia and now, in, now you joined another supranational entity as, as European Union. The answer is very simple, uh, because uh, the European Union is an, 
uh, is an entity that embraces democratic states and ensures their identity and culture and, and political so, so that they can develop and prosper within this association to the degree that maintains their own identity. And for Slovenian nation, small nation, with its own language, culture, it is extremely important. When I compare it with former Yugoslavia, I can tell you that this was much more challenged in terms of language, in terms of economic freedoms, you name it. So EU is designed in a way that ensures this autonomy and identity to grow within the larger entity. Now, we have Slovenia also a member of, of NATO. Uh, these processes of changes, enlargement, were taking place in parallel. Let me remind you that there was no EU enlargement in the, in the latest history without prior NATO enlargement. And that is why it is so important that NATO as well maintains the policy of open doors. Because NATO also serves as a very strong incentive for inspiring countries to embark on the road of a political social change. Not only military one, which NATO technically is requesting. NATO, NATO membership perspective is incentive for also other changes uh, in their respective countries. And uh, that's why also in this, in, in this respect, Slovenia is also a strong proponent of uh, the NATO enlargement. And uh, we are just, uh, uh, we are not that happy with the fact that now the forthcoming summit in, in Chicago is not going to address this issue in a way that we believe it should be. We know that this formally will not be NATO enlargement, but, but, but this summit should as well uh, take on board the aspiration of the countries. When, when we talk about the Western Balkans, these are Macedonia, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and these uh, countries are rightfully having a high expectations, and NATO at large should respond uh, to, this, to these expectations. Uh, NATO is, of course, a part of this transatlantic uh, relationship, very important one. It, it brings this security military dimension. But of course, transatlantic partnership at large embraces also political and economic dimension. Uh, all of them are extremely important. Uh, take note that there wouldn't be Europe and EU integration as we see it today unless United States after the Second World War strongly entered the political scene of Europe. Unlike after the First World War with President Wilson when United States came to Europe, helped to to end the First World War. But then United States withdraw. This was the huge difference. After the Second World War, United States did not withdraw. They remained there. Then they encouraged first Franco-German reconciliation, which brought EU on the surface. They, with Marshall, with Marshall Fund, they, they established the framework to assist the war-torn societies. And finally, they supported, through this project, Europe Whole Free and Peace, the, the process of political changes that brought Europe much closer to its unity. Now, Europe has not been completed project. Europe is, has not been yet uh, whole and free and at peace yet. It's still project it, in making. It, it, is, it is still unfinished business. And that is why we hope that the United States will again remain uh, in Europe. That mistake that has been made uh, after the First World War, that the United States would not pull over. I don't see immediate threat to that. But of course, with uh, 
with the shifts that are the consequence of uh, the global events, also uh, U.S. foreign policy shifting towards Asia, towards China. We should remind ourselves again and again, not only that that EU has not been completed project in, in its unification, but also that Europe is a historically speaking, a valuable partner to the United States. Uh, this is a partnership of a common values and common interest. And there, are, there is no other partner of that value to the United States as uh, Europe is. And we should uh, continue to invest efforts uh, for this partnership to be maintained and uh, to grow also in the future. Thank you very much. I, it was a brief, uh, a brief uh, 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 introduction on, on the on the so many issues, but I I remain open for eventual questions. Thank Please. you very much. Sorry. Without uh, any discrimination, so to say, the policy of Slovenia is that all states of former Yugoslavia should become a part of Euro-Atlantic integration without any exception. And of course, that goes also for Serbia. We, uh, we are strong supporters uh, of uh, providing this Euro-Atlantic perspective for Serbia. But, but in, in this case, it's not only that we are providing this perspective. It is also about uh, encouraging Serbia to embrace fully this perspective as their own perspective. You, you, you know what I mean? It was not a problem for Slovenia. Uh, you may call that uh, that we were lucky uh, that our political elite whatsoever had no difficulties to define its priorities. And that is al always important. Uh, unless Serbian political elites, and they have a chance now in the second round of elections, unless they define their priorities, it's not much that all others can do, but we stand ready as we help them we, with a good advice, with a political support. Uh, we hope that they will opt for the path of Euro-Atlantic integration. Uh, there, 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 there's a long way to go that, you know, of course. But it's worth to embark on this way and to start with the changes that, will ben that, that Serbian nation will benefit of. So we, we, are, we are very hopeful and uh, optimistic again that Serbia will choose that path uh, and will embark on the road of needed reforms. Well, there are some distinctive features when, when it comes to Slovenia 
uh, in the framework of the <coughs> Southeast Europe, in the framework, if you wish so, of former Yugoslavia. Uh, I, I tried to give you briefly this historical, uh, historical circumstances that were relevant for the development also of Slovenia. And there were these distinctive features played a role. But uh, bottom line is that Slovenia is a Slavic nation. And uh, these 70 years that we have lived in, in, in a common state uh, made a strong impact on, on our political culture, uh, on, on, on our political views. Uh, but historically speaking, this distinctive nature is a result of belonging to different entities in, in the past. When, when Slovenia was a part of, uh, let's say, we, we were, for 500 years, we were ruled by Habsburgs. Uh, our political mentality was strongly uh, influenced by Protestant ethics. And uh, that makes some ingredients of change or differences uh, of Slovenia related to in relation to, to other to other countries. Uh, and of course, immediately after uh, after the dissolution of Yugoslavia, that is true. I uh, that that Slovenia shied away from the Western Balkans, and what you are saying is partly the result of that, that Slovenia did not want to be treated as a part of Western Balkans. Uh, I will try to give you one simple explanation for that. Because when we left together with Croatia, this region then witnessed uh, a, a high level of insecurity, even worse, first in Croatia, then in Bosnia. So to to stabilize our independence, we wanted to be seen not as a part of violent region. When we have fully established our statehood, when we were recognized, being, you know, when we became member of all international organizations, then we felt more secure to re-enter into the Balkans and to re-establish the links that, that we have. So that is partly the explanation if you, if you see certain statistics. But you know, this statistic also uh, are produced on, on the facts that, that Slovenia is an EU member state. Slovenia is an OSCD member state. So when you take statistics, simply, you know, we are in a different group of countries. So you should not mix this, these facts with some political facts. Politically speaking, the Western Balkans is the area of our priority. This is where our immediate political, security, economic interests are strongly embedded. When it comes to the remaining challenges uh, in the region, uh, well, you have, you have mentioned two, the, the most important one, that is a uh, relationship between Serbia and Kosovo and uh, 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 strengthening the statehood of, of Kosovo, and of course, situation in, in, in Bosnia. Uh, Bosnia, as we see today, is a, is, a, uh, is a result of a Dayton Agreement. Dayton Agreement at that time was, I guess, the best possible option. Is Dayton agree Agreement still a uh, relevant framework to address nowadays problem of Bosnia? I'm not that sure. But the sensible balance has been created, and it, politically it could be challenging to reopen the box because then you don't know where you may end up. Uh, when it comes to, to Serbia and Kosovo, uh, that is a 
of, of course, a conflict that, uh, to my mind, may endure, but that should not prevent neither Kosovo nor Serbia to be very practical in developing a relationship that is not denying the basic views of one or another. In other words, uh, there is, for Serbia, recognition of Kosovo is not needed to address practical uh, issues of cooperation on the border or cooperation in the regional area and international arena. So, so uh, uh, we hope that this process will take that, that path of a pragmatic uh, relationship. But with, with this question that you have posed, there is one other danger. And when I said that this project of Europe whole and free and at peace has not been completed, uh, that, that, that means that there is a potential threat for violence to reoccur in this region. And that brings higher importance for these countries to be part of Euro-Atlantic integration. And that is something that we feel that NATO at large is not understanding properly, and that EU at large is not understanding properly. Because if Macedonia, Montenegro in particular, will not be more widely embraced within NATO and EU, then the processes in their respective countries may take the course which will not be uh, in, a, in a favor also of Europe or, or NATO. I have a question, Remember, Thank you for your talk, very enlightening. And I remember our discussion in, in, in the embassy about the, I, mean, I remember we asked how many Turkish descent uh, Congress person in the US Congress. I said none. And I wasn't expecting any, but, but you said there are a couple Slovenian descent, uh, the Congress person. So how would you foresee for them to help the Slovenian descent Americans in the United States to, uh, to basically uh, look into their uh, challenges uh, in, in the U.S. In, in general? And what would be the challenges for the Slovenian Americans, and what would be the help of uh, Congress person to uh, for those uh, issues? Uh, well, uh, United States really man maintains to be uh, a melting pot, and uh, hardly you can find any nation without any representation of this kind. Uh, in, in the Congress. As, as you know, the U.S. Congress has an extremely important role uh, because the U.S. Congress has one quality that is not that common in the world, and that is that they listen carefully to their constituencies. And uh, at a critical point of time, this means that, uh, uh, that ethnic communities all over the United States has a address, has a post office to address their, their claims, their, their, their wishes. For Slovenia, as well as for many other countries in Eastern Central Europe, uh, the Western Balkans, uh, those were critical times uh, when this the solution, disintegration processes started uh, to call the attention of the Congress and to gain support uh, of the administration through the Congress. Uh, you uh, and uh, American Slovenes were here, as, as many other ethnic communities, very strongly involved, very strongly engaged. And this is something that can be defined as their strong contribution uh, for achieving the political goals in the motherland. Uh, now, of course, this focus is elsewhere, but this was at a critical juncture 
and uh, when when we needed, of course, Amer understanding of U.S. administration and support when it comes to dissolution of Yugoslavia, you may know that there was a quite intensive political process related to the recognition of new realities on the ground. EU at large recognized Slovenia and Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina on January 15, 92. And the United States recognized on April 7, 92. Now, in, 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 in historical terms, that, that's no big difference between January and, uh, and, and April. But in terms of that particular time that we lived in, it, it was a difference. So you see, within this time frame, American Slovenes played a very important role in bringing this issue to the attention of Congress, and Congress brought accordingly this attention, this issue to the attention of the U.S. administration. So this is something that is very specific on the way how U.S. Congress is working. Now, as we have few representatives still in the U.S. Congress, they are, well, they, they, they while pursuing the policy of open doors, they, they really keep their doors always open and to listen to any good idea that are aimed to strengthening of the U.S. Slovenian cooperation. And that is something that we are doing very successfully uh, nowadays. Uh, maybe we can take one last question. Uh, so can we ask you to comment briefly on internal politics of Sunni and particularly about political parties and alliances and about the fate of the Communist Party? Well, uh, to understand the political landscape of Slovenia today, uh, you have to take a view uh, how this process was handled immediately uh, with the start of democratization in Europe at large, where well, there was a Communist Party and the Slovenian Communist Party as well as Slovenia at large being much, much more liberal, the Slovenian Communist Party was first to walk out of the Yugoslav Communist Party meetings. They walked out. That meant that that Slovenian Communist Party recognized the need for change, and they embraced the ideas, the policies, that were not purely communist anymore. And that was those were the ingredients where this Communist Party, in fact, transformed into, into a leftist still, but more social democratic, which uh, exists uh, uh, even, even now. You may claim that these are remnants of Communist Party, but this was the, 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 uh, well, the, the, the process of transformation. But basically, that means that in Slovenia, as in many other countries, that we have basically two camps. So <clears throat> the quest for statehood was supported also by a new Communist Party, but was driven by uh, so-called spring parties that came to the surface with the first free elections in, in April 1990. And this uh, separation uh, continues to exist. Of course, 
more or less every country when they are addressing their constituencies they want to be seen as a central central party they go to the center but then one goes left to the center another one goes right to the center but it is also indicative because uh, nowadays slovenia you don't have extreme neither left or right uh, which which is good because you know, uh, uh, in, in uh, Central Europe in particular, and we have also in the Southeast Europe, this aggravated political economic situation uh, brought into the surface parties that really are extreme. We, we are lucky that we don't have these extremes. By the nature of their political culture, Slovenes do never opt for extremes. They opt for certainty, for modesty. That's why everybody wants to be in the center. But of course, we have, again, left center, right center. And basically, the vision that comes out of that uh, are the result of Second World and post-Second World War traumas. Slovenia was divided then because a great part of Slovenia joined the Allied forces. One part collaborated with the occupiers, and something that you had in, in France. And but the tragic happened maybe after the the Second World War when communists they took over, and they. They took revenge, so to say, with those who collaborated uh, with, with occupiers. And that is the trauma that is hunting us even today. You know, to, to make it easier for you to understand, you know, traumas of uh, American Civil War are still there. So you see, thi this is not, you can't give away that with a decree, you know, with a formal process of reconciliation. The history is, is healing that. And the remnants of these traumas are present even as we speak. So it goes for Slovenia also. And, and that is the issue that uh, civil society has to work on. And that is on the surface. And uh, nobody is happy about that. But we have to give away the time to really to, to heal the, these differences to the extent that they will not have major in, impact on the political process. All right, thank you very much. This is our last Thank you. We have a small gift uh, for you, like, to represent that over there. OK. Here? Yeah. yeah, yeah. For Turkish coffee. Would you like to put this side? That's very practical because every morning I, I drink Turkish coffee, you know. Thank you. All right, thanks for coming. So please uh, enjoy the uh, the uh, the homemade the goodie. Uh, we'll take you to uh, this room. Oh, yeah.